That's going to be two and a half. So we'll put it down there, and hopefully that will be a little better. Have you all noticed? Everybody's talking about the birth of Jesus. And yet, talking about the birth of Jesus among us is always an interesting conundrum. Almost every preacher about this time of year preaches a lesson explaining why December 25th is not the day that Jesus was actually born and why we as a congregation are not going to have a special Christmas service. And this lesson is not about any of that. Because I found out years ago that if you're trying to influence people, one of the things to do is to start where they are. You can't start about stuff they don't know. So you find a common ground. And I'm going to tell you, this time of year presents probably the most common ground that we have even with unbelievers because they start with Christmas carols, they start with stories. We are overburdened with commercials. And all of that goes on. And yet what people often don't get is the actual story of the birth of Jesus. And so what we're going to do this morning is some more reading. And what we're going to do is we're going to be reading from Luke. And we're not going to talk about the 25th. We're not going to talk about uh, whether we can or cannot remember the birth of Jesus, whether you want to celebrate Christmas at home or not, or all of the additions that have gone on uh, that make up our traditional thing. We want to go back and just look at what did the birth of Jesus mean when it happened? to the people that were there that experienced this event. What did they learn? What did they see? What did they understand about Jesus? And that's why I asked Brother Ken to read from the very beginning of Luke. And we're just going to stay in the book of Luke this morning. And when we read them, he said that many people had undertaken to, to make an account of these things. And they stuck with that which was handed down to them by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. They lived with Jesus. They, they knew John the Baptist. They were there and knew about these events. And it said, having investigated everything, Luke says. I'm writing this out in consecutive order. Verse 4. So that you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Years ago, I began noticing this time of year when we have all of the Christmas stuff going on. If you watch the TV specials, there's going to be a lot of specials to debunk the whole idea of Jesus as the Son of God. I have no idea really why that became so popular. But where can we go to find out the truth? We have almost no writings about Jesus, even mentioning Jesus. There are some in the Romans. But we come to the Gospels. Everybody that wants to know anything about Jesus 
will do one of two things. You come and you read it out of the Gospels or you make it up. I read a while back that somebody wrote a book about the growing up years of Jesus. What it was like and what he did. And I'm going to tell you what, you can't refute it. Because we have no idea. <laughs> and everything he wrote, he just made up. But when Luke wrote this, he went back and looked at the facts, the historical aspect of that, and he said, I'm writing this so that you now can read this and you can understand the truth. Written in the first century, Luke was a companion of Paul. He was said in the early church to have been uh, the interpreter of Peter. And that doesn't mean interpreting what Peter said, but it means he was the voice of Peter, repeating to those people what he had learned from Peter. And he was aware of the sources, both the good and the bad. There were some bad things written that time. Not true. And he examined them all carefully and wrote so that we can do this today. And when we leave here this morning, I want you to just have a list of what they understood about the truth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph who was a descendant of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, Gabriel said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was perplexed. And she kept pondering what kind of a salutation was this. But Gabriel's not done. He's going to explain it to her. And he said, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. They have been looking for the birth of this promised child. And now out of the thousands of women that have lived since the promise was made, out of all of the young ladies that were alive at the time, she was chosen. God graced her, favored her, chose her to be the one that would bring forth this child. And so he said, Behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. A popular song being sung today, Mary, did you know? I had a friend that wrote a really good article on that. His opening sentence was, yes, maybe, no. There were lots of things that she's going to learn along the way. But Gabriel, the one that you can read back in the book of Daniel that was sent to Daniel, the archangel, the right hand of God, Gabriel was sent unto her. And at that point in time, Luke says she was a virgin. The Hebrew word back in Isaiah 7 meant a young lady, but it meant a particular type of young lady. And while people have argued about the Hebrew word, there's almost no argument about the Greek. She had never known a man. 
She was betrothed but not married to Joseph. And she's now with child. And when she brings forth the child, she doesn't call him Joseph or Zechariah or any of the family names that would have been. She calls him Jesus. The book of Matthew explains that. That is a compound word. means Jehovah saved. God had promised he was going to save the people. And now, here's how he's going to do it. The salvation was going to come through this one. And he is going to be great. We number our calendar years according to his birth. His thought of birth. But he's great. Throughout the world, he has been celebrated. And he's going to be called the Son of God. The Son of the Most High. And God is going to give him the throne of David that was promised to David back in 2 Samuel 7. That God would raise up of David a seed that would sit upon his throne. And that throne he will reign forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end of his kingdom. What kind of a child is this? Wow. Nobody has ever heard anything like that. Memorize what Gabriel just said. But then, the story about the shepherds. <laughs> out in their field, minding their own business, taking care of the sheep at night. It says they were staying in the fields and watching over their flocks, and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were terribly afraid. I have tried to picture that, and I can't. Because I have no idea what the glory of the Lord would have looked like. I just know when Moses said, show me your glory, God said, I can't do that, you'll die. And now the shepherds, through this angel, see at least a portion of the glory of the Lord. And the angel said, do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all of the people for today. In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. And they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among men with whom he is pleased. And when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and to Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they then made known to all of the people that were there the statement which had been made unto them about this child. And those that were now hearing this from the shepherds, it says that they marveled. The New American Standard translated that wonder. And we usually use the word wonder to mean questioning. But it means in the idea of ascribing wonder and glory. And as the word usually was translated, they marvel. Their draw, jaw dropped. They stood in awe. What does this mean? Mary, she treasured these things up in her heart. The things that she pondered them and wondered about 
But this was the story of the shepherds. Another angel of the Lord. And he described unto them the gospel. The word good news. And this day, in the city of David, which is not Jerusalem, it is Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem is a nowhere city. Bethlehem is a village several miles outside of Jerusalem. But it's where David's home was. And so now, Joseph did not go to Jerusalem, but they went to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem was born this one who is a savior of the people. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. He is Lord. Two things about that. The word Lord in the Greek was used when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And they didn't want to use the name of God and mention God. And so what they did was they used the word Lord throughout the Old Testament 900 some times and it meant God. And so when a Jew used this terminology, it had more than the idea of just one that is exalted or your master on earth. It was ascribing deity unto this child. And then, what do you think that multitude sounded like? And then I ask you this, do you think the shepherds ever told anybody else about this? Do you think the shepherds went home and their wives said, what happened tonight? Nothing. <laughs> this story of the birth in its actuality of this one who is the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, he's been born and we have seen him and we have witnessed it and we've been told by the very angels from the presence of God. And the people <coughs> marveled. When was the last time you marveled at the birth story of Jesus? When was the last time singing Christmas carols that when they got done, they marveled at the story of Jesus? We've forgotten and we've lost it. But it's in the book. And so, they bring Jesus to be circumcised. And they take him to Jerusalem. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a righteous and a devout man. And he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He's looking for the Messiah to come. He's looking for the Christ. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Christ. Average lifespan? 70 years if you're lucky. He knew <laughs> this day is getting closer. And he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry him out for him, the custom of the law, so he took him in his arms and he blessed God. He prayed and praised God. And he said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. And his father and mother were amazed at the things were being said. And Simon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for, appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. 
And then he adds what we consider would have been a strange thing. That he will be a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The promise to live till he could see the Christ and I've seen him and this is the one. But he's going to be more than just the Jews. He is a light unto the Gentiles unto the whole world and he's going to be the glory of Israel but there's going to be a rising and a falling of many because some are going to reject him. Now in the temple there was a prophetess. The word prophet meant a spokesperson for God and we have no idea what she ever said or prophesied there's no record anywhere of anything. But she was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, one of the seven lost tribes, which were not lost at this point. She was advanced in years, had lived with a husband for seven years after her marriage, and then a widow under the age of 84. At this point, she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and she began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This was not a one-time thing. She stayed there and she kept talking and she kept telling the story that this child is the Messiah. If there was no other, this is the word of God that she revealed to the people. She was a widow indeed. Worshiping and fasting and praying. The people knew who she was and she was a godly woman. They had no reason to doubt what she said. And so she said, this is the one that will bring redemption to the house of Israel. And then, backing up a little bit, when the angel told Mary what was going to happen, Mary broke out in praise and said, My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me as blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy has been from generation after generation towards those who feared him. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones, has exalted those that were humble, and has filled the hungry with good things, and sent away the rich empty-handed, has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to the fathers, to Abraham and the descendants forever. Here is an absolutely interesting thing. Jesus was not born to the king, to royalty, to riches, to power, to prestige. He was born of one out of Nazareth. And you remember the phrase, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I'm going to tell you, the best response to that was, come and see. Come and see this one that we've talked about. And God now has kept his promise and he has appeared unto her. And the promise unto Abraham that he would bless all nations is now here. Do you remember all of this? 
And I'm rereading this story this week. I reread it, I don't know how many times this week. I'm going to keep rereading it. Because it is the story of what God has done for you. That God has entered into the course of affairs of the life of men to do something great and eternal. And this is it. And it involved Gabriel and the host of heaven and the unnamed angel. They came and they revealed unto people this is what God did. This is what God is doing for you. This is God's Son unto Mary. A virgin would conceive. Under the shepherds, the glory of God appeared. Under Simeon, he lived to see the Christ. And under Anna, the great one of the promise of God. In order for all of that to take place, an event that nobody can explain, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. Wow. Sometimes preachers like to, they like to know things that they don't really know. For example, what would actually have to happen for God to be squeezed into a human form. One of two things I've watched. People either ending up denying the humanity of Jesus. Or they end up denying the deity of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you. Don't you dare. Believe what it says. And this is the story of the birth of Jesus. When I was playing organ for the baseball games out in Arizona, our announcer was uh, uh, Jewish. And he and I had some interesting discussions throughout uh, the month of March. And after we had discussed for a little bit one day, he looked at me and he said, this is the difference between you and me. We worship God and you worship a baby in diapers. And I laughed. And my response was simply, what a baby. God manifests in the flesh. The one promised to Abraham, the one promised unto David, the one called the Son of God, the one who is said to be the Savior, the King, the Messiah, the Lord of Lords. Yes, he started in the Incarnation. But he ended up at the right hand of the Father. Glory and honor forever. The Apostle Paul wrote sometime later. By common confession. Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh. Later translations and copies. Will read God was manifest in the flesh. But he then was vindicated in the spirit. He was seen, observed by angels and proclaimed among the nations and believed on in the world and taken up into glory. When you think of the birth of Jesus, always think of where it leads. The birth is the beginning, but it's not the end. And so we celebrate first day of every week, not just 
the birth. But the whole birth, life, death, resurrection, and glory of Jesus. Remember me. So the invitation should be. Do you believe? Do you believe that he not only was born. And all of these <clears throat> statements are true. But he then was rejected and crucified and raised again. And being raised. He said go and preach this gospel in every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can be saved by this one that was born so many centuries ago. Arise. Be baptized. As together we stand and sing, we invite you to come.